Well, hello, everybody. Russell Goodman, Supply Chain Brain, Senior Editor here, welcoming you to our presentation today. It's titled, well, Cost Savings Versus Investments, Understanding the Economics of Warehouse Automation. You know, as the economy continues its uncertain path, well, it's imperative that you protect profit margins as best you can. Your business may be among the many that are looking to warehouse automation to drive operational performance and to minimize variable costs. But let's face it, not all automation is created equal, and that makes cost-benefit analysis a nuanced endeavor. Well, today, we're going to dive very deeply into the economic impact of warehouse automation. And to lead us in that and to provide the advice that supply chain managers need to evaluate solutions for their businesses is Stanislas Norman, Managing Director of Exotech North America. You know, you want a solid understanding of the, of the cost savings, the timeline for return on investment, the operational benefits that are associated with automation. Stan is going to give you those very things. Perhaps most important, you will see how to ensure your automation project doesn't become a cost center. Other takeaways today? Well, how about this? You'll see the major drivers behind growing fulfillment costs and just how warehouse automation helps address them. How about key considerations for choosing the right warehouse automation solution? and the key differences between warehouse robotics and traditional automation, and of course, their economic impact. Believe me, a truly valuable presentation is just ahead. But let me just remind you that we want you to participate today. After the presentation, there will be a Q&A session. And the way you participate is by filling in the box at the bottom of the screen with your questions. Stanislaus will address as many as possible before we sign off, but any that are left hanging, he will get to and you will see that answer. All right, now to our presentation and to Stan Norman of Exotech North America. Stan, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Thank you for the great introduction. Um, I have a problem turning on my camera. Um, but let's get right into it. Um, so talking about uh, the economics of the warehouse, we can start with maybe the big numbers, uh, supply chain costs. So they're uh, clearly on the rise. And if we look at uh, 2022, uh, here's a big number. Business logistic costs in the US have exceeded $2.3 trillion. That's the highest mark of all time. Uh, what that represents is uh, roughly a 20% increase uh, year on year versus 2021. Um, and uh, it's roughly 10% of the gross domestic product. So that's a huge, huge increase in uh, business logistic costs. Now, if we look at how those costs are structured, there's four main drivers to those costs. Uh, you have transportation, uh, equipment, labor, but also warehousing. And that's the one that uh, we're going to uh, dive into today, warehousing, uh, the economics of warehousing, and how automation can help uh, optimize some of those costs. So, I'm sorry. All right, so what's driving costs? If we look specifically at uh, automation, we see three uh, main types of, uh, of drivers. Uh, the first one is labor challenges. Uh, so it's today, if you know, for operations that have very manual processes, um, uh, they have uh, very manual intensive uh, operations. Now, uh, you've all heard about, uh, you know, the big resignation uh, in 2022. And clearly, at the moment, um, the country in general, across many industries, is facing a lot of labor challenges. For warehouses, uh, what that means is that uh, 
we estimate that there will be by 2030 about 2.1 million unfilled jobs in warehouses. Uh, the result for warehouse operators is a high turnover uh, and high costs that come associated with this turnover. So, you know, if you're looking at um, uh, replacing, um, hiring a new operator between the recruitment cost, the training cost, onboarding cost, you know, it's an average of five to ten thousand uh, dollars per uh, per new onboarding. Uh, so that, there's a huge cost uh, for operators. Uh, looking at the second driver, um, it's space. So the cost of storage has gone up. Um, so for industrial space, uh, the rent has reached $9.59 a square foot, which is a huge increase, 7, 16% uh, versus the same period last year. And that's also being driven up uh, by the cost of um, material in the building industry. Uh, so uh, if you've renovated your house or your office space in the past uh, two years, you've seen that uh, those costs have uh, deeply increased. And uh, actually, it's estimated that since 2020, they've increased uh, in average by over 20%. And the third driver that we see is an evolving channel mix. And in particular, with the rise of e-commerce uh, comes associated costs. Um, so home delivery, for instance, is one big driver, uh, and the costs associated with that represent 10 uh, to 15% of an e-commerce brand sale. So that is huge. Uh, and we consider their, you know, an average 2 to 3% for standard retail fulfillment. So let's, uh, let's consider how automation can address each of these challenges uh, briefly. Well, labor challenges, you know, if uh, warehouse operators are having trouble recruiting uh, staff. Of course, automation is um, a pretty simple solution to that. If you talk about storage, uh, well, one advantage of automated system, and we'll, we'll see more of that in detail later, is the increase in storage density. So with automated storage, you can increase your storage height and your storage density, because then you're tailoring um, uh, systems for uh, robots, one of the types of automations and not for humans. So you can really optimize the space. And uh, the third one, when we talk about evolving channel mix, well, automation offers a lot of advantages uh, for operators that want to address multiple channels with uh, the same systems. So businesses turn to automation. Um, yeah, more than 20% of warehouse operators have invested in automation over the past years and specifically to help address labor shortages. So um, in average, across the market, we'll see that most automation vendors offer ROI within three years. Typically, it will be two to three years, sometimes four. Um, but as Russell mentioned in the introduction, not all automation is equal. And there are many different types that also address uh, different needs. So let's dive into more details and uh, let's talk about what sort of automation is available for warehouses today. Uh, but before uh, we talk about that, we can talk about what automating the warehouse means because uh, warehouses have uh, different processes from inbound to order fulfillment to outbound. And uh, today we can focus on goods to person order cooking. The reason why we want to focus on that is that if you look at uh, warehouse processes, it's the one process that is the most labor intensive. And it's also the one that takes up the most space in the warehouse uh, because of the storage. So it has a strong impact on the cost of operations. So if you look at uh, uh, manual order fulfillment times, uh, and we have, a, we have a graph there on the slide, uh, we consider that 60% of uh, an operator's time is used to walk around the warehouse. That means walking from one storage location to the other, um, pushing carts. We estimate also that in average, uh, in a traditional fully manual warehouse operation, a worker walks up to 10 miles a day. So that's, uh, uh, that's also um, you know, very intensive work uh, for the labor force. If you go back to if you go back to the graph, you see that 25% of their time is actually picking, and that's really where the value added is, and that's really the one thing that uh, with automation you will see that um, we remove from the operator tasks the last seven, the remaining 75%, uh, 
and they can focus on the value added tasks, which is really the PPE. Now, if we look at the one on the right, the warehouse activity costs, uh, we see that order picking represents 55% of warehouse operational expenditures. And that's really, you know, to show that that's the one process when you talk about automating your warehouse uh, and also considering the economics and impact of automation. That's really the key process that operators should focus on. So talking about automation. All right, so we um, identify three main types of automation, uh, which are traditional automation. So those are technologies that have been um, around for the past 20, even 30 years. Um, then we have low throughput AMRs. So uh, autonomous, autonomous mobile robots. Um, we'll go into more detail of what type of technologies those are, but um, those are typically uh, solutions that can help uh, address uh, a single process in the warehouse. And then the last one is robotic ASRS, which stands for Automated Storage and Retrieval System. And those are systems which we consider get the best of both worlds in terms of flexibility and storage density. Uh, yeah. So traditional automation, just some key criteria. Uh, these are proven technologies that have a very high throughput, also high storage density. Uh, uh, one specificity of that technology is that it's uh, PLC driven, and that means it's often project specific with a lot of configuration to do on site during the installation. The second category, low throughput AMRs. Uh, so this is really a robotic technology. So in terms of technology, that means it's software driven. Um, that means it's you know much more modern technology and also more resilient. Uh, it's highly modular and flexible, so very useful uh, for um, uh, warehouse operators. Um, you know that want to address yeah singular pain points at their warehouse. And robotic ASRS systems, like the low-throughput AMRs, are also software-based, so very reliable and very flexible. Uh, but they also offer the same advantages as traditional automation in terms of throughput and storage density. OK, so let's deep dive a bit more into each of these categories. So if we look at traditional automation, really, the key advantages of these ones are that they are proven technologies and they have a high throughput and high storage. Maybe the only downside uh, for customers that want to um, invest into these types of technologies is the flexibility. Meaning that uh, when you invest in these technologies, uh, you will design a system for your warehouse uh, that needs to be designed uh, for the five to 10 years that are coming from your operations, um, meaning that uh, they're, uh, uh, I would say, built with a lot of uh, rigid structures on site. We talk about conveyor systems, we talk about crane systems, that uh, once they are designed and installed are very difficult to modify. Uh, they're also susceptible to bottlenecks uh, due to their design. That means you have some single point of failures, for instance, systems where you have elevators usually systems where you know that elevator is a single point of failure. And there are also systems that have uh, high energy consumption by design. If we look at low throughput AMRs, uh, these are very flexible systems. The downside here is more the performance. Um, so you can find different types of systems in that category. Uh, some are uh, what we call collaborative robots, meaning they're designed um, you know, to work with humans in the same environment. So that's, for instance, the, the picture you can see at the bottom of the slide where uh, you see a warehouse operator uh, working next to a, a robot. Um, so these are systems that are easy to scale and um, that can also uh, have very low disruption for the operations because uh, they can be uh, installed in a warehouse that is already operating manually and you can progressively uh, improve the processes. The other types of systems um, that we find in this category are the shelf moving robots. Uh, so they have a higher throughput than the first category. And they're also easy to uh, scale post installation 
uh, really the only downside here is uh, compared to traditional automation is the throughput and also the storage density because um, by design, you cannot use the full height of the warehouse. You're limited to the height of a, of a shelf. However, like all robotic technologies, uh, one key advantage in terms of reliability is that they have no single point of failure. So looking at the last and third category, the robotic ASRS. Uh, so that's where we find the most advantages um, that combine uh, you know, the advantages of traditional automation and of robotic technologies, meaning that uh, these are systems that offer a high throughput, uh, that offer a high storage density, uh, as you can see on the picture of the rack. On the, on the right, uh, you have the storage rack that uh, uses the full height of the warehouse. Uh, because they are robotic technology, they have no single point of failure. What I mean by that is that um, typically uh, all the automation is carried by the robots themselves and they're redundant items of the system. So if one robot fails, it doesn't stop you know, the system or a storage aisle of the system. Uh, the robot can be put aside and the system continues to operate. There are also very convenient uh, solutions to support omnichannel fulfillment. Uh, because they're by design agnostic uh, to uh, the channel. Um, and they are also very easy to scale post installation, um, as is the case with uh, most robotic solutions out there. Uh, and one key reason for that is that uh, they differentiate storage and throughput. And so it's easy to extend your storage uh, without modifying your throughput, but it's also easy to uh, increase your throughput without uh, touching your storage by just adding robots inside the system. So warehouse automation economics. Uh, so we've listed a few things uh, to consider when um, uh, operators are looking to uh, automate their warehouse. Uh, the first one is really uh, the capacity to forecast the need into the future. Um, and typically what we see with customers, uh, so we talk to a very broad range of customers, uh, some startup companies, some Fortune 500 companies. Uh, usually what we see with startup companies is a difficulty to forecast you know, beyond two, three years. Um, and so these are also companies that uh, will want to automate one warehouse, but which is key in their operation because that's where, uh, uh, you know, that's the only warehouse they will have. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, yeah, when we talk to large Fortune 500 companies, these are companies that are able to forecast their business over a longer period. And when they talk automation, uh, they talk about a network of warehouses. Um, so this is this is really different. And based on you know where your business is on that scale, uh, you'll look into different forms of automation to address different challenges. Uh, the second one is really the channel mix. And it's uh, very important to consider. Uh, whether you have single channel operations or you want to address omni channel operations with the system. Um, really, if you want to address omni channel operations, that you'll need to have a system that is agnostic uh, to the type of channel um, and that can uh, address, you know, ideally what uh, operators need to find is the solution that will allow them to address all their channels with one system. Uh, operations downtime, that's the third one. So can your operations tolerate downtime? That's really key. That's really key. That's where, you know, you go looking for technologies that are reliable um, and that, uh, you know, will minimize disruption to your operation, whether it's during the installation of the system or whether it's during the operation um, over the lifetime of the system. And here, you know, whether you have a single warehouse, um, for a network of warehouses, the challenges are not the same. If you have a single warehouse, then you know, that's key. Any downtime is critical to the business. Also, when you have a network of warehouses, of course, downtime is critical, but then um, uh, operators should look uh, into technologies uh, that will help build uh, you know, the resiliency of their network, so to speak. Um, fourth one, does your warehouse require high throughput? So here, you know, it's uh, are you storage constrained or are you throughput constrained? And that will really also guide your choice in terms of, uh, you know, if storage is critical and you need to increase your storage because you're very constrained in your space, then you will need to go for solutions that allow you to uh, use the full height of your warehouse. 
if you're really throughput constrained, uh, then you know there are more solutions out there, um, and uh, you can you can find the one that's uh, really tailored to your needs. Flexibility to scale for peak, uh, so that's where uh, the flexibility and potential for scalability of uh, the solution that you would choose uh, is really important. And that's, uh, in my opinion, where robotic technologies have a strong advantage uh, because it's easy to um, adapt to a uh, change of volume in your operation by adding more robots. And there are different models to address that. We can maybe talk about it um, later, but uh, you know, some, some companies offer, offer robot as a service, some companies offer robot rental. But what that shows is when you go for robotics, um, you really then have that possibility of improving your flow temporarily to address a peak. Um, last one, do you need a band-aid solution or a supply chain transformation? Um, so that mm -hmm. is a key question. Why? Because, um, you know, if you look back at the different technologies that I presented, some of them will require an investment and a design that is uh, time-proof uh, over five, 10 years. Some of them will address you know, single pain points in the warehouse. So maybe operators will look at their operation and identify one pain point and they will want to address that one and go to the market, find a supplier for specifically a solution to address that pain point and automate it. They won't be looking at, you know, automating the full warehouse. Um, but if on the other hand, uh, you know, customers are looking at a full supply chain transformation, then of course, these are then consideration uh, for which, you know, we're talking about impacting their business. Um, they'll consider the way they work with suppliers. They'll consider the market needs, uh, specific needs that need to be addressed in terms of uh, competitivity. And that will uh, really help them uh, to select the one solution that can uh, really help them and strategically change uh, their supply chain. And that's it for uh, for my presentation. Rachel, uh, back to you. Thank you, Stan. Thank you very much. That was a terrific aerial view followed by a highly detailed drill down that I think has got the information that uh, the audience members uh, will need and appreciate. Uh, speaking of the audience, uh, questions are pouring in, and we're going to get to those in just a moment or two. But first, if I could, I would like to uh, pose a question uh, or two to you. Took some notes, and I noticed that you said 20% of warehouse operators have invested in warehouse operation. Well, you know, if I were to come to you, if um, automation, I, sh I should say, if I were to come to you or if an audience member were to come to you and say, well, Stan, just how do I know when I, a member of the 80% that haven't invested at this point, how do I know when to automate my warehouse? What are you going to tell us? Yeah, that's a, that's a that's a good question, Russell. Um, so, really, the first uh, the first question that um, you know they should ask themselves is, what are the pain points in the warehouse? What what do I need to address? Um, is it uh, unloading the trucks? You know, is it uh, shipping uh, items, shipping cartons? Um, is it item picking, uh, an order fulfillment? So that that really the first point is really to understand what are the pain points and what do I need to address. Um, so then when looking at the pain points, um, you know, if it goes back to that, that, that grid, for instance, is it storage capacity? Then why is that? Do they need more inventory on hand? You know, if the answer is yes, I need to have more inventory on hand. I need to find a way to densify the storage in my warehouse. Then, you know, that's, that's a driver for automation. Um, another one can be quality, you know, uh, if, uh, they see that one of the pain points, for instance, is accuracy of order preparation. Uh, then that's really one thing that automation can address and improve um, because of course, it's, you know, by design, much more accurate than uh, manual operations. Uh, if it's a question on throughput, you know, if uh, it's a, a warehouse that has difficulties um, to face peak uh, or just to face their annual growth, uh, can be due to labor shortages, um, then you know that's that's really a good telltale sign to say, okay, well, I can't just hire more people and throw more people at my problem. I need to automate. 
Mm -hmm. uh, another one is the SLA. Do they need a uh, faster order to delivery experience for their customers? And that goes back to competitiveness uh, on the markets. You know, if they want to really work on that competitive edge, um, do they want to, you know, implement, implement a next day delivery? Uh, do they need more cutoffs during the day uh, to be able to implement that? Uh, that's, a good telltale, that's a good telltale sign also that uh, uh, it's a good time to automate. You know, it seems uh, it seems quite obvious that uh, robotics is growing in uh, adoption relative to traditional automation. We've touched on that, but let's just drill down for a moment or two. What do you, what exactly do you think is behind that? What's driving that? Yeah, uh, so that's definitely a trend we see in the industry and uh, amongst our customers. Um, a lot of people are asking more and more about robotics versus traditional automation. Uh, to me, it comes down to some you know, features, but also uh, some, I would say, technologically, technological philosophical questions. Um, the base thing is really robotics offers in general more versatility and can address a broader range of needs. Uh, as I explained, traditional automation is uh, great in terms of throughput and storage density, uh, but they also have a very rigid design. Uh, so they're not adapted to customers that have little predictability uh, for their operations. They're also difficult to scale. But behind those features, uh, it's fundamentally a yeah, different technological approach to automation um, because traditional automation is mainly PLC driven, whereas robotics is software driven. That's a huge difference. So if you look at uh, traditional conveyors, for instance, uh, they need to be installed and they need to be wired on site. And that means they're programmed on site for a specific warehouse. So, um, you know, when suppliers install a conveyor system at a customer's warehouse, they will design, implement, and program a conveyor system that is specific to that operation. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, an ASRS robotic system soft is software-driven, so it's not coded for a strict movement pattern. Uh, the way it works is it uses algorithms you know, to determine a path to carry products from one location to another, um, and the software is really there to solve a problem. So every time a product needs to be moved in the system, it's a problem that we throw at the software and that, you know, the software's role is to find the right solution and optimize uh, the movement to improve the efficiency. Um, what that means is also that the software is not made uh, for a client site uh, because it's a, uh, you know, any robotic technology will have a standard piece of software to drive their system. And what that means is it really improves the maintainability of the systems over time because it's not specific to a customer site and it's maintained uh, by the robotics provider at the company level. Um, it also has less single points of failure, so that really improves the reliability. Um, and that the fact that it's software-driven also means that the software is uh, not programmed on-site, and that really reduces uh, the, sh the installation times. So that helps to shorten the project times also for customers. Good, good information there. Let me just turn to, <clears throat> pardon me, turn to another topic. I think it's fair to say that resilience, resilience is really uh, top of mind for many, many people in supply chain these days. So let's talk about the growing importance of that. What do you think that's all about? Yeah, um, so, you know, supply chain is has always been a strategic issue for, for customers and within supply chain, resilience is key. Um, now, what we've seen in the past um, three years uh, with the pandemic are, you know, strong examples of strong disruption uh, on a global level uh, that have really tested the resiliency of uh, the supply chain. Uh, you know, looking back at the, the COVID pandemic, we can agree that on many levels uh, for the supply chain it was one of the most impactful events of these past decades. Um, and, you know, for customers, what that meant is that they saw ruptures uh, in the supply of their products, but also a strong change um, in the customer usages with the development of well, a strong spike in e-com um, and home delivery. Uh, and, you know, to add to that, uh, during the pandemic, of course, we also had uh, labor shortages with a lot of workers that were confined in their homes. So that's just to say, you know, over this past decade, a lot of uh, our customers have seen uh, what an event like that pandemic can have on their operation and on their business overall. So it, it is a key point. And uh, today when customers think supply chain, you know, they think about it's a network with nodes. The warehouses are nodes in the network. 
And it's impossible to have a resilient supply chain um, without having a resilient intralogistics. So really, what you know, when customers make technological choices about what they will put in their warehouse to automate their processes, the choice you know to go with a technology that is itself resilient by design uh, will really help them to build that resilience in their supply chain overall. You know, Stan, anytime that you talk about automation, you are talking quintessentially about transformation. So, you know, uh, there clearly is a difference, I would imagine, between transforming your warehouse and transforming your supply chain. Well, give us your view on that. What do you say? Yeah, so um, I would say transforming a warehouse. Uh, when we talk about transforming a warehouse, uh, we mainly talk about within a warehouse, focusing on individual processes. So for instance, you know, an operator can focus on uh, unloading the trucks. Let's say it has been identified as a pain point in their warehouse. And uh, it'll go out and find a supplier uh, that will, um, you know, address that pain point for that specific warehouse. Um, and that can work very well. And that, that may be the perfect solution for that customer. Um, so it's, you know, really in their organization, someone is making a technological choice to address a pain point. Uh, when we talk about um, transforming a supply chain, you know, we're not uh, talking about those band-aid solutions. Uh, it's really at, um, at a customer's level in your organization, a more strategic decision. Um, and, you know, that implies to address uh, strategic items that really can have an impact on the business model of the company itself. Uh, so, and we're talking about the lasting impact. Uh, so it's it's much more also it's much more disruptive for an organization. It requires a much better planning. Uh, it's usually much bigger investments, um, and uh, you know we're talking about investments that are usually can be validated at the level of the board of a company. Uh, and it's it's a whole other level of discussion. In particular, for us, you know, when customers talk come to us to talk about uh, their supply chain, not just one warehouse, um, you know. Then we can we feel we can have a much stronger impact on their business uh, by designing with them a solution that then they can replicate across their network. Uh, well, Stan, so let's talk. Really, let's talk more specifics here. Do you have a customer that you can point to who came to you, came to Exotech, and said, "We want you to transform our supply chain as opposed to just our warehouse"? Is there somebody you can point to who did that? Yeah, absolutely. So we have um, uh, we have some some customers that we we, we can communicate on. So uh, in Europe, for instance, we work a lot with Decathlon, who is a uh, the leading global sports retailer, and uh, they came to us with a project in mind uh, for their full supply chain. Um, so we worked with them to design uh, a warehouse model that they could replicate across their network. And so we are currently implementing those solutions across their network in Europe. Um, and uh, really, when I, I talk about a warehouse model, it's uh, really an end-to-end -end design from uh, the arrival of the goods in the warehouse uh, to uh, the shipping of the goods. And we worked with them on a program to design that warehouse and then replicate it at a rhythm of multiple warehouses each year. So, you know, they, they don't come with us uh, to us for just addressing one warehouse and one pain point in the warehouse, they're talking about their network. And it is, it, it is a strategic decision for them. And then that also, you know, builds a part, part, strong partnership between them and their mm -hmm. supplier. Mm -hmm. Of course, of course. You know, I, I want to turn now to a concern for retailers. I mean, clearly future channel mix has got to be a big issue, got to be top of mind for uh, for retailers. And so if you would, tell us how automation is going to ease that pain, if you will. What's uh, what's the impact? How's that going to help them? What do you say? Yeah, um, so I think that's really where uh, the flexibility of the solution comes in. Um, as I said, it's, you know, you, you, it's important to find a solution that is channel agnostic. Um, I have in mind an example of a, uh, a customer um, to which we sold a system uh, and it was installed last year in his warehouse. Um, and this this is a I would say on the range of the, the smaller companies um, in, in the spectrum of customers we talk to in retail. And um, that customer halfway through the installation of the product, so he was very focused on B2C sales. And halfway through the uh, installation of the project, uh, he explained that his wholesale operations with Amazon um, 
were becoming you know, a more and more significant portion of his business. Uh, and he needed to address that channel with the system. Um, and how we were able to address that is that uh, we didn't change the design of the robotic system. Uh, we didn't change the design of the storage. Uh, he, did, he didn't specifically have a need for more storage. So what we did is that we simply installed a different picking station on that same system. And the robot started working with that station. So just by adding a different type of station to his system, he was able to address uh, his two channels with one system. Um, and that, that's really an example of you know, how software-driven technologies, in particular robotics, can address that with their flexibility. Um, because you don't have to redesign the full system. Uh, you can just add portions of equipment. And uh, it's very easy to reconfigure in the software. Uh, At this point, I just want to remind the uh, the uh, the audience uh, to keep your questions coming in. We're going to get to your questions in just a moment. I've got one or so left for uh, Stan. We're going to get to yours. And again, if we're unable to get to all of them while we're here and during the presentation, Stan will answer them offline. Stan, let's talk a little bit more. You mentioned the B2C. You talk about these various uh, uh, operations that people have. B2C and B2B fulfillment, omni-channel facilities that can support both of them. Give us just a little bit more information about that, would you please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so usually when we talk about B2C, uh, so e-com, we talk about item picking. Uh, so that's, you know, an operator will prepare an order for a customer that can have one or two items from uh, different SKUs. So um, they'll need a system that can... Uh, bring multiple products from which the operator will pick and assemble the order for the customer. Uh, B2B fulfillment, there's um, a two types. It can be uh, what we call full case picking, uh, meaning uh, you know, customer will invest in an automated system, uh, central storage to then distribute cases of products to stores or other uh, fulfillment operations, warehouses. Uh, but it can also be um, item picking. For instance, we have customers in the um, grocery or retail industry uh, who do uh, item picking for store replenishment. Uh, really what um, is interesting here for customers with these new robotic technologies is that they can address both with the same system. Uh, and that's, that's really the ideal uh, solution for them is a system from which they can uh, pick at the item level, but also at the case level. And that means that with one single operation in their warehouse, they can really address all these channels. Mm -hmm. Stan, uh, one more question before we get to the uh, the audience uh, questions. Um, briefly, tell us, uh, since robotics as a service seems to be picking up, help us understand both the pros and the cons of that approach. Walk us through that. What do you say? Um, yeah, so uh, robotics as a service uh, it's um, a service that uh, some robotics companies offer, not all. Um, for customers, the advantage there is just to uh, have their uh, operational costs under control, meaning you know that they'll, they'll pay a, they'll pay a service instead of investing uh, in a in a system. Uh, for Exotech as a business, uh, we have decided to not take that approach. Um, it's really a business decision. It comes down to the risk. We don't want to tie our revenue to our customers' activity uh, five years, 10 years down the road. Uh, so we, we really have a model where we sell systems and then we have operational costs um, over the lifetime of the system. But um, really, another solution that we have developed to address uh, customers' needs for flexibility is robot rental. Uh, so what it does is... Uh, Contrary to robots as a service, it means adding temporarily robots, but then customers will only pay for those robots, you know, during uh, the needs, the time where they need it to face a peak, for instance, or to face a temporary growth before they can invest in additional robots. The rental option can also be a ramp up to an investment. So th there are multiple models out there. Robotics as a service definitely is one. Uh, there are other solutions to uh, achieve that level of flexibility for customers. Even-handed uh, answer there. I like that very much, and no doubt the, the audience does as well. Let's turn now to some of the questions that are rolling in from our attendees today. Here's a question that uh, asks for reality. They say in terms of rea reliability, 
what can you realistically expect from these automation systems? That's a great question. What do you say? Yeah, expectations should be high. Um, you know, when uh, without going into numbers, when we look at the amounts that can be invested by customers into these automated systems, really, uh, they should have high expectations uh, on reliability. If we talk about uh, system uptime, you know, uh, requirement of 19% seems like a minimum um, for most systems. Um, and that's usually what, you know, we find across the industry. Um, but specifically more about reliability, uh, I think the technological choice is also important uh, because some, not all technologies are equal. Uh, what really helps to uh, drive reliability is also the absence of single points of failure. That's something that comes back often when we talk about robotic technologies, but it's it's really a key point. Um, it's, you know, robots are redundant items in the system. One fails, the system does not stop. And that, that's really key to, uh, uh, you know, keep uh, operations running uh, throughout the shifts for our, our customers. Audience member, another audience member has another question that uh, goes to a, a, a realistic situation that they're going to face. They ask this, how long is it going to take me to modify, which is to say to add storage or throughput, whatever. How long is it going to take to modify an existing robotics ASRS system? So walk us through that. What's what's your thought? Um, yeah, so that that's, is a question that uh, we have from uh, most of our customers, especially because, of course, as I mentioned, one of the advantage of the technology is scalability. And so, you know, that's really tied into that is, okay, you, you know, we say it's scalable, but when the time comes to increase the throughput of storage of the system, how does it work? Uh, what's the disruption on my operation? Um, and so one advantage here of the uh, robotic ASRS solutions is that uh, uh, they dissociate storage from flow, meaning that uh, for most systems, the storage racks are purely passive and they're not tied into the rest of the system, you know, in terms of, so you don't have like uh, mechanical moving parts like conveyors or you don't have uh, power lines in your racks. So it's easy to increase storage by building outside of the system. And then, uh, of course, there's always a bit of system downtime, but then you tie in that storage to the rest of the system. And in those cases, we talk about, uh, you know, a couple of days to maybe a week of downtime for the warehouse, well, for the system. So that's very limited. Now, if we talk about throughput, uh, there's no downtime when you increase throughput because it's robots. So they, you know, they're injected inside the system and they start working. Um, and there's really, uh, there's no, because uh, the, the software is not, once again, specific to that customer. And that's really a key point. Uh, when a new robot is added to the system, you know, the it's recognized by the fleet manager and uh, it works alongside the other robots. So really increasing throughput should not generate um, any downtime. And so I guess, you know, taking, talking about how long it would take to modify, and then it's just about the lead time to provide the, the new equipment. What I like about these questions coming in from the audience, these are real life questions here. And I just wonder if there's uh, something else that we might say about uh, the throughput improvements that we might expect after we've adopted one of the automation systems that we're talking about. Any any further views on that? Uh, yeah. So if we you know talk about going from a fully manual operation to an automated system, uh, we see a five-fold increase in storage capacity and in throughput. Um, now, this can be less, you know, with a low throughput AMRs, for instance. Um, but, you know, if we're talking full warehouse automation and the use of the full space in the warehouse for storage, that's really the minimum to expect for customers. Another question coming in here. I like this one. Another, another real world uh question here um having to do uh is an additional picking station indicative of an additional robot so the questioner there says obviously this is something we've we've touched on but we need a little bit more detail is an additional picking station indicative of an additional robot well 
what would you tell that person? Uh, so not necessarily. Um, it's really the question is what drives the addition of the station? Um, you know, if it's driven by a need for higher throughput, of course, the first way to address higher throughput is to put more robots. And then that can lead to uh, adding uh, an additional station if you, you know, reach the, uh, I would say, the picking capacity of, a sta of the existing stations. Uh, so that's one. But otherwise, uh, you know, for instance, I was mentioning our customer for which we added a station. We did not necessarily add robots for that um, because, you know, that's also the thing with uh, when I talk about dissociating the flow and the storage, uh, we also dissociate the flow and the number of stations. Of course, there's a relation between uh, the picking speed you'll have at the station and the number of robots in the system. Uh, but that's also due to the number of stations you'll have. So you can add a station without adding robots. Uh, that may lower the average speed, speed across all your stations, but that may be what drives the requirement for a new station. So. I know you're handling this question from time, uh, quite often these days, but it's an important one, and let's address it once again. Safety measures that have to be considered. In other words, if we're talking about movements of pedestrians versus of robots, what safety measures have to be top of mind? So walk us through that. What do you say? Yeah, so yeah, that again comes down to uh, the choice of technology. Um, for traditional automation and uh, ASRS robotics, uh, usually those are technologies for which all the automation is fully fenced in. So it's not collaborative and the operators are separated from the mechanical movements. And that is really a strong driver of, uh, you know, uh, limiting safety risks on site. Um, if you look at collaborative robots, uh, you know, then those are technologies for which of course, uh, the design of your operations in the warehouse and the way your operators will work with the robots really need to be taken into account. Uh, that's also one where training of the operators is really important. Uh, and they need to be really conscious of the, the, the risks. But uh, I would say most of the uh, collaborative robot technologies today on the market you know, have integrated strong uh, safety um, I would say, you know, sensors and uh, processes to avoid uh, safety risks. Let's talk a little bit more about integration. Um, audience member says, or asks rather, will robotics implementation have to integrate to CRM WMS? If so, how is this typically handled? Well, good question. What do you say? So uh, to that, I can talk about how Exotech does it. Uh, so when we... Um, install a system at a customer's warehouse. Uh, we have, of course, an on-site system, so it's mechanically interfaced with the customer's operations, but there's also the software layer, and so our system is interfaced with the client's WMS. Uh, as for our systems, uh, we have a standard um, API, uh, so it's based on a REST API protocol, um, and uh, typically throughout the project, uh, we'll work with the customer uh, to make sure that the interfacing between our system and their system goes well, um, and then everything will be tested before the system is commissioned on site. Here's a question I no doubt the uh, C-suite wants to uh, hear the answer to. What kind of data, what type of data do you see people using to validate the automation investment? Seems to me that's an important question. So walk us through that. What do you say? That's a, that's a good one, and it's uh, it's not a quick one to answer. Um, but so some of the uh, yeah really necessary data is first of all uh, when you're talking about automation, you know you're going to talk about an investment. You're going to design a system, size a system, and for that you know it, it's it's important to understand um, your activity throughout the year. You know your peaks. Uh, so historical data about your operations is key. Uh, absolutely key, and uh, uh, you can't design a, war a, a warehouse automation system without that. Uh, now, looking into that data, what uh, uh, you know typically customers provide um, are uh, you know the number of SKUs they want to store in the system, the way they want to store it, if they want to put multiple SKUs per bin, maybe with separators or not, um, and also the throughput, so the number of uh, of orders they prepare per day, uh, the number of picking line that represents. 
uh, how their shift operation, how their operations are organized in terms of shifts. Uh, you know, same thing if they want to work just one shift per day, or if they're willing to work three shifts a day, then that's a different system design because you'll address all your volume over a shorter or longer period of time. So that really drives the system design. Um, so yeah, all, all these considerations are really important. Here's one I simply have to uh, to ask you, uh, but please uh, briefly uh, respond. The uh, the audience member says, "Blow our minds." Is there any specific piece of automation that you feel will change how we are looking at automation within our warehouses supply chain in general? Well, do that, please, Dan. Blow our minds. What do you say to that person? Um, okay, I would say uh, maybe, I mean, I don't want to take a talk about uh, other companies on, on Roadmap, but I think in terms of automation, you know, we've explained how we can automate processes. I think what, you know, will come to the market in the future um, and things that uh, customers can expect are these to see these automated systems take on uh, more and more features um, to uh, help reduce the overall footpath of the systems in the warehouse. So, you know, that goes into uh, system design, but uh, today, if you look at a, a standard uh, goods to person picking operation, you'll have a goods to person picking system. And it's uh, usually surrounded by a lot of conveyor systems for uh, sortation, uh, shipping, uh, but also um, for palletizing, depalletizing. Um, and I think that's, when you talk about palletizing and depalletizing, that's something where robotic system, because they're not hard-coded and they're software-driven, can really bring um, an added value to those processes by really helping with the sequencing of how products uh, are, uh, you know, come out of the system and are brought to the palletiz palletizing uh, systems. Uh, I think well, that, that's really something that will come to the market. Well, consider my mind blown. Thank you, Stan. Appreciate that. All right, listen, um, we've left, we've given the people a tremendous amount of information today, but I think it's imperative that we leave them with a nugget that you think is extraordinarily important that you want them to carry with them as they leave the presentation. So final question, final question. It, it, it's obvious that automation has got to seem like a very uh, expensive project to smaller brands, no doubt about it. So tell folks in that space what some of the things are that they they need to take away in order to make an argument to the C-suite or the, to the VP of finance about the need to make this investment. Help them out. What would you tell them? Yeah, so, um, you know, for instance, yeah, talking about small brands, a lot of them come to us with a plan for the next two, three years. Um, and they see a lot of uncertainty beyond that point. Uh, and this is where uh, they should explain to their management that robotics is a great uh, lever to build a gradual investment plan to accompany the growth of the business um, because they can start with a small number of robots and then you know add robots and build that fleet and build that system as the need for throughput increases. Same goes with the uh, storage capacity. Um, so, we, and also for these small brands, uh, operation disruptions can be quite a challenge. So I would also recommend for them, uh, you know, to explain to their management that they can go uh, for technologies with shorter deployment times uh, that will not disrupt their operations. Really. Um, now, what we see as well also for a lot of small brands is uh, simply today, a lot of them do not have the choice if they want to stay competitive. Uh, it's not really do we want or don't we want to automate, it's when do we automate. Uh, so it comes down to, you know, sort of do or die choice for them. At this mm, point. Abs absolutely imperative for them to do that. Stan, appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. Thank All you. Right, folks, so I want you to take a look at your screen now very carefully. Uh, clearly, Exotech has left you with a great deal of information today. We're urging you to go to that URL. Learn more about the company and more particularly about the SkyPod system. By the way, this uh, URL will be sent. This link will be sent to you, those of you who are attending today. But valuable information is there because Exotech wants to continue to have a relationship with you. All right. Well, 
I want to thank Stanislaus Stan Norman of Exotech North America today for sharing his time and expertise with us. Again, folks, if we didn't get to your questions, and I see there are quite a few that are hanging right there, Stan is going to get to them offline. And a big thanks to you, each and every one of you, for attending today. Well, this concludes our presentation. So until next time, Russell Goodman, Supply Chain Brain, saying so long.